about Mad Max. It was a very pioneering movie in many regards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, what have you been thought when you got script of Mad Max? What have you idea how it's supposed to look like before? How whole sure because Max it's one. a cult film, big scale cult film. Yeah, I hadn't seen Mad Max one when George rang me. It was the day John Lennon died. I remember that. I was on a movie. And they rang and said, we want to meet you to talk about Mad Max. I said, shit, I better go and see Mad Max. I haven't seen the first one. So this is Road Warrior we're talking about. Yeah. So I met with George. We didn't have video split. We didn't, he'd, he'd do rough little sketches. We didn't have storyboards. He'd do rough little cartoons in the morning. And this guy's got a mind like you have no idea. Like, George is just a wonderful, unbelievably creative human being. And I think the film to me just evolved. I hadn't done any action. In fact, they said, I said, well, you know, Mel's driving this car. They said, we've got two cars. I said, you've got two cars? You've got two cars? Well, we're gonna crash it and then fix it up. Wow. And it was, it was run and gun a lot, but it was very specific. George was very, very specific about the shots. Um, and I learned immediately not to worry too much about whether the sun was there or there, or whether it was cloud or whether it was raining in an action sequence like that. You can have a look at a lot of those sequences and this, it doesn't matter, there's so much going on. The ability to use like the old two Sierras and to, to, to strap it on the front of a dune buggy and give the on and off switch to a stuntman and have him just get in amongst the action. When he was close enough, you know, you're on a 30 mil lens or something with an optical flat. Um, he just presses the button and there's some spectacular stuff in there. Shot exactly like that. A lot of handheld, a lot of simulated travel. I'd never done that before. George taught me, he pushed me. He said, be bold, be bold as you like, do what you like. A lot of that film, the truck's not even moving. I remember shooting a fair bit of it on a, on a Western dolly, on a rough, rough ground, on a tripod, with people up on top of the tanker doing things. I was shooting Mel in the behind the wheel once doing, once again, driving uh, with a long lens through the windscreen. And all of a sudden that camera, and George was grabbing the tripod and shaking it all over the place. And I was at one stage on the front of the tanker and Mel was actually driving himself. And with Richard Merriman, a focus puller, see I operated myself, um, I'm on the front, front of the engine, handheld with a bungee and an array here with a 50 mil lens. And it was the moment where Mel, the real Mel, is driving. We're doing 30, 40 mile an hour, chased by everybody. And the, uh, his nemesis busts or smashes the window in a little shot like that. Well, I'm holding this thing. And it, the array with the hard eyepiece is hitting my eye and my eye was bleeding, so I just shut it off and aimed it. I just aimed it at Mel. And I think, you know, roughly there's something. And we, uh, we cut and stopped it. George said, how was it? I said, I don't know, I just, <laughs> I aimed it. It seemed, uh, we'll see. So we got the dailies back and George loved it so much that he, I think he accentuated the movement, the shake on all the other shots around it to make it, to give it that energy. So it was stuff like that. I mean, I learnt every day and I learnt about danger. I said to George a couple of times, one occasion I was on the, on the back of a, insert vehicle, it was just like a pickup truck on a little platform. And I used to use a, a football bladder with grease in it and just sit the camera on that. No heads, no fancy, you know, nothing. <laughs> uh, and there was a car coming towards us that had a roll, had a flip up and roll in front of me, you know. We we're traveling back with it. And uh, I said, George, this is, oh, this is dangerous, is it? <laughs> he said, no. He said, you're going that way, the car's going to hit the ramp and s slow down, you're fine. And we were fine, but... And there were very, very few accidents on it. A um, couple, couple of stunt guys got hurt, but they get, that's what they get paid for, and nothing was major. No. But um, I learned a lot about simulated travel. I learned a lot about being gutsy um, and about how to shoot stunts, obviously how to, uh, you know, when something's flying through the air, what do you do? You go slow motion. Do you want to go 28 frames, 26 frames, 22 frames? A lot of it shot at 22 frames a second, just to give it a little electric energy. You know? 
and I used on that what we call uh, Ned Kelly was a famous Australian or infamous Australian bush ranger. He used to hold up, he shot a few cops and stuff way back in the 1800s. And he finished up, he made himself a steel sort of cover like a big drum over him with a little letterbox type for his eyes. And his arms were out, but his body was covered with this heavy steel. And uh, McGrip made up a, um, a, cr a crash box out of the nose cone of two torpedoes he got from you know, a, a disposal store, an army disposal store. It was like an egg. And he cut a little slit in it. And I put the two Ciari in there, set it on a flat bed. And it was very easy to line up because I'd stick it in a car tire. It was like an egg in an egg cup. And you can tilt it, angle it any way you like, uh, cover it up with bushes and leave the battery off. And if it got hit, it would roll. It wouldn't get embedded into the earth. You know, we did shot a lot of stuff on that. And we called it the old Ned Kelly. I went to Canada to do a film. Special effects guys up there. I said, you've got to, you know, I've got a crash box. We've got the Ned Kelly up here. So it had travelled. You mentioned, very interesting, when George Miller told you to be gutsy. And you told, you just told you, learn to be gutsy. So can you uh, elaborate how important for a cinematographer to be gutsy? <laughs> Well, I think certainly in a film like that, you have to be. Um, it's, it's taking chances there, both physically and, and professionally, artistically. Um, you know, you lock off a camera with an exposure set and the light changes during the shot. You can't change it, it's too late. Um, take, just taking chances like that, not being precious. Now, I don't, I don't want to sound as though you don't care. No, no, nobody would understand you this way. You do <laughs> care, you do care. But also I can see George and his producing partner Byron saying, you know, it can rain and we can cut into this sequence. It doesn't matter. There's so much going on. No one's even going to be thinking about that. No one will even think that the vehicle is not moving, that you're moving, the camera's moving and there's wind on it. No one's going to think about that. And I learned a huge amount about that, about just taking, taking chances, uh, taking chances with light. They're just, I mean, putting cameras where you might not have thought, like the Ned Kelly putting that in close to the, you know, there's a classic with the tanker rolling at the end, this massive truck rolling into the Ned Kelly. Uh, we had one hit once and destroyed a lens, a 50 millimeter lens, but the shot was saved. It was great, boys, you know, boys having a good time. And a very small camera crew was me operating, lighting, operating. Richard Merriman, who would, I think he'd just reached puberty. He was like, he's still my operator now. He operates B camera for me, but he was like a, a kid um, and a loader. That's basically it. And then we had another two or three people on the other, the other camera. And a, it wasn't really a second unit. There was Andrew Lesney came and shot a few little things for me, a few little tiny little things, but it was a small, it was a small crew. No video split. Now that's where Mel said, and that's where George said, you know, I take my head away, my eye away from the eyepiece. And he knew he had it straight away. In fact, doing Fury Road recently, I went down and I prepped that twice to Australia. George had specifically wanted some very small 3D cameras. He wanted to shoot 3D, he didn't want to shoot 2D. He wanted to shoot 3D. The film a lot of it takes place, a majority of it takes place inside a small cabin of a truck with five or six, seven actors in there. The traditional 3D cameras, 3D rigs would, wouldn't work in a million years. You needed to get in there close. The cameras needed to be here on wide lenses so you can feel, you could feel the breath of the actors, you know? So he had these cameras designed, 3D cameras. I went down there and shot some tests with them and it, you know, it wasn't, 65 mil, but it was, was good for what the film was going to be. It was great, great little thing, and it was going to work. But George said, I have to have the right operators for this. I just can't have anybody. So he actually tested operators out. We had a, we had a sort of a, a mock-up truck, and we got some extras in there, and we brought in three or four operators, put a microphone on them, put a camera in there, so George could see how they could relate to actors. 
see how they could move the camera, see how they can change, you know, move your head a little bit this way, this way, just clear the back a little bit or just sit back or... And out of that, he picked the, the operator that he wanted. It was very important to him, very important. He likes somebody, he likes his operators to relate to the actors. He, he has what he calls a circle of grace around the camera where everybody respects, like the director, but obviously the actors as well. You've got to know how the actors feel when they come in there. You know, they're putting themselves on the line there forever. And I mean, you are as well as a DP, but they've got more to lose, I think, than we have. And uh, you've got to be aware when they come out that you're ready to go. That's why I mentioned, like, with Meryl Streep, if you have a flare or something in the background, don't you? Shoot the lady. Oh. <laughs>